You may be seated and turn in the scriptures, if you will, to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 12 through 17, though we'll probably pull from this entire passage, maybe some from the entire book as God's Spirit leads. I went back to graduate school very late in life. Uh, Ms. Kendrick and I felt very strongly the pull of God to get a graduate degree in counseling psychology. In Missouri, I am a, a licensed counselor. Because of the work in graduate school, I had to do and read a lot of research. And in some ways, I became a research nerd. Now, that's a step up. I was just a nerd. Now I'm a research nerd. And, and researching the primal needs uh, of men and women and boys and girls. And study after study after study after study says the most primary need that every person has, whether they're children of God or not, the primary need of every individual are human relationships. To know somebody, to be close to somebody, to have someone that you can both be with but also talk to. And the number one need in God-blessed America right now is for people to have good relationships. Back in the 90s, 80s, and 90s, our society became a kind of a cocoon society. We... we, we pull out of our garage and we put the door down with a remote control. We go to work, windows rolled up in our car, people work in cubicles or they work in places. They never establish friendships. They come back home and pop open the garage door, pull in, and they kind of cocoon in the family there. And those needs for relationships aren't being met. And guys, I want to tell you something. And, and this is not research proven, but this is my gut after the last 45 years of doing what I do. The primary need, one of the greatest needs, I'd rather say it that way, one of the greatest needs in the life of any New Testament church is the need to have godly relationships. And guys, isn't it good that when God creates within us that kind of a need, that he doesn't leave us without explanation on how to have godly relationships. And in the word of God, in this book of Colossians, now it's not the only place, but in this book of Colossians, Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, gives us some incredible words on how you and I can have the kind of relationships that are life-changing. Whether it's a husband and wife, parents and kids, one of the tougher ones, parents and teenagers, people at work, people in the community, but, but the body of Christ together. We are intended to have relationships that are over the top good. That we know that we know that we know that these relationships are solid and they're good. So I want you to stand with me and I want you to read this text. Actually, I'll read it and you can just read along with me if you will. And we're starting in verse 12 of chapter 3 of the book of Colossians. If you're there, give me a real big amen. amen. Thank you. I could actually hear you. Verse 12, therefore, now because of this, and that because of this is because we have been changed by Jesus Christ, because we're all to be one in Christ. He gives us things that we shouldn't do. And then in verse 12, because of these things, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any one of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitudes in your heart, or gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, thank you for this time that we have together. And I pray that you will use this scripture in a way that folks who are here who have struggles with particular relationships will find in your word ways to get above that and beyond it. I pray that there'll be husbands and wives who are at odds that are are brought back together by the principles taught in this passage. I pray that dads will be better husbands and dads and that wives will be better wives and mothers. I I pray that co-workers will be better co-workers together. I, I pray, Father, that there will come from this such a unity at Cornerstone Church that that. Every move that we make, we make together going forward with a unity that only you can give. Now, Father, be with us. Be pleased to speak through me as your mouthpiece. Allow me to empty myself so that your spirit may course through me. And may there be good hearers in the congregation today. And may you begin right now to get hearts ready for the invitation so that when that invitation is given, people stand out and come forth to do your will in their lives. Be with us, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. There there are two things that I'm going to call your attention to this morning from this passage, and then there are a few takeaways that I want to give you that I think are incredibly important. Now, the first thing I want you to see is that God gives us relationship apparel, And, and he begins this section of Scripture with the word, clothe yourselves, literally translated to put on. Just as this morning when I said to Miss Kendrick, hey, what am I wearing this morning? And she said, well, are you going to pick out my clothes? And I could no sooner do that than the man in the moon. <laughs> However, I, I am functionally colorblind. I, I, I don't see shades of things, so if I dress myself, there's no telling what I would look like. And when they quit making granimals, I was in trouble, guys. I, I, I just couldn't... And some of you are old enough to remember those. Uh, but this is something, when Miss Kendrick pulled this out, and I looked at it, and I said, that's great. And I put it on. I clothed myself with it. Now, there's some implications to those words when Paul tells us to clothe ourselves. It, it means, number one, that it's doable. You can do this. You can clothe yourselves with the apparel that Paul talks about this morning. It also means that it's a choice. You have to choose to do this. This is not something that God just automatically does for you. Now, the Spirit of God will guide you in it. The Spirit of the living God will enable you to put these on, but it is your choice to make whether or not you're going to heed the words in in the Bible here. Now, guys, it's for you. This apparel is made for you. And we know that because Paul talks about holy, chosen. You you know who the holy ones are? You know who the chosen ones are? I get this question all the time. How do I know if I've been chosen by God? Well, if you're saved, you've been chosen. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whosoever will may come, Jesus said. And if you've obeyed the call... If you've surrendered to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are the chosen, and what I'm fixing to tell you is for you. Now listen. I want to give you five parts of the relationship apparel. And remember, it is your responsibility to put these things on. 
And you might want to write these down as we, as we walk through this because these are good and godly things that you need to make a prayer, a matter of prayer in your life. Look at this. Number one is compassion. Literally, from the Greek, when you do the word studies on this, literally it means to let your heart be filled to abundance with compassion. And compassion is feeling and touching another, another person's hurts and their burdens. When I have compassion on someone and, and I'm, I'm sitting with them in my office or in their home, what that means is you are so full of this compassion that when their heart aches, your heart is aching right along with them. Now, we cannot identify with every need that every person has. For, for example, uh, God has been very gracious to Janice and me. We have not had to suffer the loss of a mate, which is one of the toughest losses that a person can face in life. We've never had to face the loss of a child or a grandchild. And we pray that we never will have to face that. But does that mean when I sit with somebody who's lost their wife or their husband that I cannot have compassion for them? Absolutely not. When I sit with somebody, I try to listen. I try to tune in. I try to hear not only what they're saying with their words, but I, I try to pull the emotion out of that. And I take the pain that I've had in my life, the, the difficulties... I, I, and and I, you all probably don't know, but some of you know that I, I've been in a 25-year companionship with depression. And some days it's really good, some days it's horrible. I'm starting to sound like my mother, Janice. Um, I mean, she, that's how she said horrible. She said horrible, and I just said it, and it dawned on me I'm getting more like her. She was a sweet saint of God, though, so that ain't all bad. Uh, when, when you're sitting with someone and they're talking to you from the depth of their heart, if you're willing to tune in, you can have your, your heart abundantly full of compassion and, and a desire to help. Do you have all of the answers for people? No. And sometimes all people need from your compassion is for you to be there. To be willing to sit with them for a spell. To, to, to be willing to just listen. I remember one time I was, I was in the home of a lady who had terminal cancer. And, and she was under hospice care. And, and her days were very limited, very numbered. And I went in to talk to her, and, and, and I said, what, what is it that you really need to talk about today? And she said, Terry, no one will talk to me about dying. Everybody knows I'm dying, but my kids keep telling me it's going to get better. You know, people are praying for me, and, and they're saying they're praying, so God's going to heal me but we all know I'm dying. Could you talk to me about what that might be like? Now, I don't know the answers to all of that. I, I, I do know that when you close your eyes in death, when your heart beats its last, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus comes and greets you and ushers you in to paradise with him. Are you listening? Let not your hearts be troubled. John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you, and since I go and prepare a place, I will come again to receive you so that where I am, there you may be also. I am a biblical literalist. I believe that God said exactly in the Bible what he meant. And I believe that when we breathe our last, the Lord Jesus comes, he meets us, and he takes us to be with him in paradise. 
Now, I don't have all the answers, but I hold a book in my hands that I can read to people, that I can pray over people's lives. And we're taught the first thing that we put on in this list. And please listen again. This is a choice we make. We choose to put ourselves in the other person's shoes and we deal with them with compassion. And the second piece of apparel is kindness. And what exactly is kindness? I, I don't imagine that I need to define this for you, but Paul Paul talked about kindness in many different passages. Peter talked about kindness. Even if, if you read James and you really understand the book of James, which some people believe is a really harsh book, the book of James is about kindness. Why? Why does God emphasize that over and over again? And, and why do you suppose... God would have to tell people who are authentically born again over and over again to let kindness reign in their hearts. Well, here's the answer to that. It, it is because kindness isn't a natural, way, a natural way for human beings to live. In the flesh, in, in the carnal man, it's dog eat dog. It's me above you. It's me getting my way even if I have to trample you to get my way. Kindness says, no, it's not about me, it's about others. It's about Jesus first, others second, and you last. And J-O-Y spells what? Joy. And when you put Jesus first, others second, yourself last, you will live with the joy that is unparalleled. When I stop insisting on my rights, when I stop insisting on things my way, and I begin to put other people in front of me, and I begin to look simply for what God wants in my life and how God wants me to live, there is a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. <laughs> Kindness. It is a shame, though, folks, that kindness isn't always the way church folks treat one another. I, I did something this morning inadvertently, but I had to go back and apologize because it was rude. I, I greeted somebody, and I just gave them a wave over the shoulder as I was walking away. Didn't look them in the eye, didn't say, how are you doing? And I had to go back and apologize because that simply isn't kind. It isn't the way. And if you look around the world, you'll see that this piece of apparel is missing in many different places. Look back at the past election cycle. Were politicians kind to one another? No, they were mean and ugly and vicious. Look at marriages you know. Are there marriages that you're aware of where husbands and wives simply are not kind to each other. I, I, every couple that comes to me for marriage counseling, if I could get them living in kindness toward one another, it would go a huge way in, in dealing with the marital problems that they have. One of the, one of the toughest seasons in life for Janice and me was, was raising teenagers. And uh, we had one daughter who uh, never missed curfew. Uh, if she was going to be late or needed to be late, she'd call. But I won't even let her talk about some of the things that she did when she was a teenager because I don't want to know. <laughs> and uh, the poor girl was, was grounded most of her senior year of high school. <laughs> I mean, a week at a time, two weeks at a time. And, and, you know, Janice and I very early on said, with Emily, she's got to have a firm hand. Now, my son did stuff, but he couldn't help but confess it. He'd feel guilty, and he'd come late at night and say, Pops, can I talk to you? And he'd tell me what he did. <laughs> we decided that, that we could be all over these kids and, and smother them and never let them do anything. And, and we decided two things. 
Well, actually, three things. One, we did have to be firm and teach the truth. We had to teach them how to be adults. But number two, we would do what we did in kindness. We would not be harsh, ugly people. And number three, for our own sanity, we would laugh our way through it. (laughs) And they gave us plenty of things to laugh about. But my friends, this again is a choice. You do not have to be unkind. God's spirit lives within you. And you have no reason to be unkind because the Spirit of the living God will work in you and develop kindness in your heart. The third piece of apparel is humility. A humble heart, which by the way, folks, is the most Christ-like attribute that a Christian can have. Most relationship problems that I've seen have been the result of a proud heart. That I know what I know and that I'm not changing my mind. And whether it destroys our relationship or not, I will not budge. Now let me take husbands and wives as an example here. Husbands are not always right. Gary is seldom right. No, I'm sorry, Gary. I am so sorry. Let me take that back. I'll rewind it. I never said it now. You know, honestly, no, I'm not going there. Sorry. All right, wives are not always right, correct? Human beings are not always right. So the truth of any situation usually lies in the middle of what we both think is right. And a proud heart, the opposite of a humble heart, destroys relationships. That's in marriages, that's parents and children, that's in the workplace, that's in the home, that's in the church. In fact, proud hearts divide churches instead of unify churches. Gentleness is the fourth piece. Gentleness could have been translated there as meekness. Now, don't don't go to the point that you think gentleness is weakness. Gentleness is not weakness. That word literally translated means power under control. I, I... have the power of the Holy Spirit living through me. I have called, been called to do certain things. There is truth of the Word of God that must be defended. But you take that power and it's under control. Greatest example of all time of meekness or gentleness, of power under control. Jesus is prepping his disciples for his death on the cross. And Peter says, no, I I, I won't let that happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And then he told them, when he was on the cross, I could call a legion of angels to come and take me off the cross. You remember that? What is that? Jesus had the entire power of, of heaven under his control. But he had that power in gentleness, in meekness, in quietness. He went as a sheep led to the shears. And he gave himself. They didn't take his life. Nobody could kill the living son of God. He gave his life for you and me. That is gentleness. The the fifth article is patience, (laughs) an endangered species in the 21st century where we have everything at our hands and we are gratified instantly with whatever we want. There's a twofold meaning to patience. The, The first is the ability to wait. 
to sit quietly with God and wait on God. Most of the big mistakes that I made in being a pastor and leading a church was, was running ahead of God. I would sense God leading somewhere, and instead of waiting for God to fully develop that in my heart, waiting to get people who would come beside me to help make that happen, I would run ahead and be impatient. And I'd just start, here's what we're going to do. And when I did that, those things never fully succeeded. Sometimes they were divisive. And I had to come back and make amends for those things. So it's the ability to wait. The ability to sit with God and wait until God fleshes out in your life what you're doing. I think I told this story Wednesday night. When I first got saved, our our youth group did, we were together all the time. And every Friday night, Saturday night, there was something going on in our church. Our youth pastor was incredible. And, and John took us. We had a, a guy, he really wasn't in the youth group anymore because he was in college, but he was a, a, a preaching student. And he was having a weekend revival at, at Avondale Baptist Church in North Dayton, Ohio. And we're sitting there singing the great old hymns of the faith. And, and all of a sudden, before there was even special music or anything, the, the back doors just got knocked open. And this guy comes screaming down the aisle, I can't take it, I can't take it, I can't take it. And he fell on his knees and people began to pray with him and he gave his heart to Christ. This was a guy who wouldn't go to church with his wife. This was a guy that was unsaved and lived like it. And his wife had been saved 35 years prior to that. Every Wednesday night, every Sunday evening when they when they came uh, to the altar to pray. She was lifting his name up. And Carl Morgan, the, the young man that was preaching, had gone out to, to see this man. He told him, that's the last thing that I'd want to do, come sit in a church and listen to a kid preach. Guys, the conviction of God. 35 years in the making to patiently wait on God and God listened and God moved and God made that happen the first part is the ability to wait the second part of the apparel of patience patience is to just keep going just keep on keeping on as our pastor Joe used to tell us You're doing right. You don't grow weary in well-doing. You wait on God and you just keep moving forward with him. Now that's the relationship apparel. Those five items. Now, how do we use those in our lives? How do we make that part of who we are? So let's look at the appropriation of the relationship apparel. And there's six ways the apparel is appropriated. First, we are taught to bear with one another. Now that relates to the apparel of compassion, which means to let your heart be filled to the brim with compassion. And and so we're to bear with each other. In, In other words, we're to understand that no human being is perfect. We're to understand that every human being makes mistakes. Now, stay with me. Every one of us, the godly and the ungodly, every one of us makes sinful choices sometimes. Every one of us deliberately refuse to have compassion on another person. That's why we are taught to appropriate that. That's why we are taught to bear with one another. One of the most hurtful things that happens in in the Christian community is when we see one of our great leaders fall to immorality. Not 
don't need to call any names. We all know. We all know some. We've all read about them. In, in, in my denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, there have been a multitude of guys. By the way, do you know of about uh, 20 or 25 of us kid preachers that, and I'm not a kid preacher anymore, but, but when we started and went to Southwest Baptist College, about 25 of them, only two of us had finished the course. People are sinful. Now, we're not taught to overlook sinfulness. We're not taught to overlook when people make bad choices. What we're taught is to bear with them. Galatians chapter 6. If one is overtaken in a fault, those of you who are spiritual, go to him in meekness. Thinking about yourself, lest you be tempted also. When, when you look at a brother, and, and you see that that brother, sister, is living in a way, is doing things that are not productive in their life, that they're doing things that are absolutely sinful, what do you do? You don't overlook it. You begin to talk to them in meekness, in quietness, and you bear with them. You stay with them with a heart of compassion toward them, and you love them through it. Remember the proverb says that love will cover a multitude of sins. That doesn't mean it will hide them. It means that it will help them. The second way we appropriate it, we are to forgive one another. That relates to the apparel of kindness. Uh, and, and guys, listen to me very carefully. We are taught to do this in a very particular way. Uh, Paul, Paul didn't just say here that we are to forgive one another. What did he say? He, he said, Let's forgive in the same way that the Lord forgave us. So think back to when you were saved. Think back to your life before Jesus Christ. Now, many of you were raised in the church, and so you think, well, I don't have a testimony. Guys, you have the same testimony that I have, that you were a sinner, lost in your sin, no hope of eternal life, and one day the Spirit of God convicted you of that, and you turned from your sin and turned to Jesus Christ and were saved. That's everybody's testimony. But guys, what did he do? He, he sacrificed in order to forgive us. He laid his life on the line. He gave his life so that he could earn our salvation. We couldn't earn it ourselves. And so the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect Son of the living God, lived on earth with the same temptations, yet without sin. He went to the cross and He carried our sin. He purged it according to the book of Hebrews. He didn't just cover our sin like the sacrifice in the Old Testament. He purgatoried it. He purged it. He took it away. Now, that isn't something that happens because people drop money in the box at the back of the church when you have your funeral. That's something that happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior in the here and now. And you and I are taught to forgive like that. When I get a couple in marriage therapy to the point that we begin to write out here are things I need forgiven for and here are things I forgive you for and we do that ceremony together and we put those things under the blood of Christ and real forgiveness happens I see couples not, not just staying together 
But I see couples begin to flourish because they've learned to forgive. It, 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 is, it is the centerpiece of, of all church fights. I've led revivals, and I, I, I quit doing revivals a long time ago, but I, I've led revivals. I've done conferences in churches where certain people haven't talked to other people for 25, 30 years because of a decision the church made that long ago, and they didn't get their way. That ought not so to be. Are you listening? We, we don't have that option not to forgive one another. We don't have that option to say, God forgives you, but I'm not willing to. Number three, we're taught to have love. And this relates to the apparel of humility. R read verse 14 and underline this in your Bibles. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Put on again, guys, means a choice. You can do this. There is no excuse. And Paul's very specific here in that love, that, that quality that I really do love you. I really do care about you. I have this compassion and this kindness towards you. I, I really do love you. And, and in humility, I am going to esteem you in a way that brings us together while instead of tearing us apart. Now listen to me very carefully. And I don't care where this is. If you're in a relationship where there is not unity... And I don't care if it's marriage. I don't care if it's parents and children, children toward parents. I don't care if it's in the church. If you're in a relationship that is fractured, it is a love problem. It's because you're not loving as Christ loved us. You're not sacrificial. You're not gentle. You're not kind. The fourth advice here, appropriation, is peace. And that deals with gentleness. Now here, when, when Paul talked about peace in the first part of this, or, or talked about gentleness, that was an inner quality. But the peace here is not an inner quality. The peace here is a behavior. It is a cognizant decision to get along. It is a cognizant decision that in the body of Christ, there is to be a peace. There is to be a unity. And it isn't always easy. But when you have gentleness and kindness and meekness, gentleness, you can do this. And then number five, relationship apparel is to live biblically. And that deals with patience. God simply cannot bless unbiblical relationships. Are you aware of that? This is a hard saying in the 21st century. But I know many, many couples who are choosing to live together rather than get married. And that is a direct violation of the word of God. That is what we call sin. And how do you expect God to bless that relationship? God can't bless sin. Are you listening? God can't bless sin. In the church, where there are fractured, fractured relationships, how in the world do you think God's fixing to bless a church where relationships are fractured? Huh? Are you okay? I'm just saying, this is the truth. And then we're taught, we wrap this all together with thankfulness. We thank God for what he's doing. Now let me give you a couple takeaways. I have, I have just a minute or two left. Number one, 
Every one of us need to evaluate our relationships in the light that we are children of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. In your marriage, husbands, are, are you wearing God's relationship apparel? Wives, are, are you wearing the apparel? Are you gentle and kind to each other? Parents and children, teenagers. Have you put on the apparel? In the community, your neighborhood, your work, are, are you a person of God wearing his holy relationship apparel? And here's a biggie. You ready? In the church. Not the church universal. In Cornerstone Church. Are you wearing God's relationship apparel? Gentleness, kindness, meekness, humility, patience. If there is something that will stunt the working of God in a local church. It's fractured relationships. How can God work through people who can't even really love one another in the body of Christ? Second, good relationships are a choice. They are a choice that you make and I make to clothe ourselves, to put on, Relationships are something that if you're a child of God, you have to get right. Who in your life have you been fractured from, broken away from, and you still have issues? You say sometimes, well, I've tried my best to forgive them, but I just can't forget. Well, of course you can't forget. The human brain wasn't designed by God for you to forget. Of course you remember that, but you put it aside deliberately. Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to choose to fix the relationship with? By the way, number three here, bad relationships are also a choice. It isn't that they just happen. Bad relationships happen for a reason. And then number four, there is a key to godly relationships. And Paul gives it in this passage. And the key to godly relationships. Let the love of God flow through you so that it is flowing out from you to other people. With kindness, and gentleness, and meekness, love, thankfulness. All these parts of the relationship apparel. Can I ask you a question? Are you in right relationship with God and with the church? Are you now? To be in right relationship with God, one has to repent of their sin. Turn to Jesus Christ, accept him as your Lord and Savior, and, and publicly pronounce that you're his child. Now, I'm not adding to salvation. Whoever believes in the name of the Lord will be saved. But that decision will never really be concrete in your heart until you share it with other people. Today, what keeps you? You know that you do not know Jesus. You know that you've never had that experience of being saved. What in the world could keep you from accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior? You cannot give a real reason because there is no real reason. Guess what keeps you? What keeps you from fixing broken relationships? 
Now that can begin right here in this altar as you come to God and you say, Lord, even though this may be hard, I'm willing to forgive. It may be very hard, but you, you may need to come here and say, Lord, you need to give me the humility to admit that I've been wrong. And, and, and the meekness to go in a spirit of humility and ask someone to forgive me. Again, what would keep you from doing that? Pride? Stubbornness? Father, we love you. There's no reason for a Christian to have fractured relationships in their lives. You just teach us too much about that. You... Uh, you give us everything we need to have right relationships with everyone around us. And if we will humbly allow your spirit to lead us, we'll have right relationships. Father, there are two things that I believe very deeply in my heart this morning. One is that there are people here who need to be saved. There were a number last week who asked me to pray for them. They know they need to be saved. And Father, I would pray that this morning that you would convict them to the point that they would come down this aisle and say, Pastor, help me. I need Jesus. But Father, I'm also convinced that there are people that need to do real business with you in this altar this morning about relationships in their lives. I want you to have your way. Please fill us with your spirit. Please accomplish in these next few minutes what you want to accomplish in each one of our lives. I pray and ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.